All right, so last week, we're going to go ahead and jump in so we don't run out of time. Last week, we introduced our, our next class. So we are talking about the gospel in our everyday lives and not only how we process life through that filter of the gospel, but how we begin speaking the language of the gospel in our everyday life. And we don't think about the gospel that way very often. And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about these six weeks that we're spending looking at this is because when we talk about the gospel and we even say that word, we talked about this last week, we really, if I say the gospel, what, what is the first thing you associate that word with? Yeah, G, I heard about it. <laughs> yes, Jesus' death, right? His sacrifice, his death might say death, burial, and resurrection, and all those things are accurate. It's, it's, that's true. But I think what I'm so excited about us doing over these next few weeks is seeing how the gospel is so much more, how it's so much deeper, how it's so much more applicable to just every facet of our lives. And, and sometimes as believers, we don't, we don't think that way, right? We just kind of we get comfortable, especially if we've grown up in church and we've just, we've, we've just done this our whole lives. Sometimes we get in this, this mindset of, okay, well, the gospel is about my eternal security, right? It's about I, I, I receive it, I pray a prayer, I accept Christ, and then I get on with my Christian life. But we almost think that that's separate from the gospel. But the amazing thing that we're going to see is actually we don't separate our everyday Christian life from the gospel. They are so connected that like you can't separate those two things. So last week, we just kind of started training our minds with an overview to think rightly about the gospel. So that's what that is. If you, if you didn't, weren't here last week, there's some blanks on that first week. You can, you can borrow somebody's book and fill them in, or I think Robbie's probably going to post the video where you could go back and watch last week. But this week, I really want us to jump into the meat of what we're going to do. Uh, so the idea that we kind of landed on is we want to be a people that are fluent in the gospel, right? Anybody fluent in a language, like even English, like anybody feel like you're fluent? <laughs> anybody fluent in more than one language? So, no, all right. So I was going to say, I'm, I'm definitely not bilingual, and I think we discover, if you hear me speak long enough, you'll know I'm probably not very fluent in one language. But, um, but you know, as believers... We need to be fluent in the language of the gospel. And so this week, we're going to start doing that. And so when we talk about a language, right, on the first page there in week two, there's some things that make up language, that go into a language. The first thing has to do with words and their meanings. Vocabulary, right? To, if, we're gonna, if we're going to be fluent in a language... We have to have a vocabulary, right? We've got to have words, and those words, and, and they've got to have meaning. But a language is more than vocabulary, right? Like, you know, I took several years of Spanish. I know some vocabulary words, but does that make me fluent in Spanish? No. Language is much more than vocabulary. It's part of it, but there's more to it. We also... We need to know grammar, and that was the least fun part of, of any language, whether it was English or, um, or Spanish, is, is the grammar part, right? How you structure words, and you put them into meaningful sentences. If I stood up here and just started, you know, trying to regurgitate every Spanish word I know, you know, the likelihood of it making a, you know, a sentence that, that meant anything would, would be tough, right? And that's, that's the only one that I really have much vocabulary in. That's the closest I could get. So, but grammar, it's important in building a language. But there's another thing that's important with language, and that's culture. Uh, my, my daughter is, is taking Spanish in high school. She's like in her fourth or fifth year of taking Spanish. Like, she's doing really well. And but one of the things she's learning this year is how different cultures use that language, right? Spanish in Latin America in, or in Mexico, Honduras, it's very different from Spanish in Spain, right? Culture plays a big part of language and because culture is like the words and what they actually mean in a context, 
you know, coming from East Tennessee, you know, coming to Texas, I found there's some similarity, right? I've got sayings that when I lived in Ohio for two years, uh, if we can just take a moment and just, you know, mourn that with me. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. But, you know, I would, I would drop my Southern sayings in, in Ohio and people would look at me like I had two heads, right? Because the culture, right? My, I was using language within a culture, right? I had context and they would look at me like, what? The beautiful thing about Texas is, you, you know, y'all get me. Like I can use some of those sayings. Like, oh yeah, I'll say that. <laughs> or I know what you mean by that. Yeah, so there's some nice similarity there. But vocabulary, grammar, culture, all of those are part of a language. Does that make sense? And that's just a good thing to think about as we start talking about the language and we start thinking about the gospel in terms of a language. But there's another thing I want us to see that's so important about being fluent in a language. And so we say part of language is words, vocabulary. So I'm just going to write some words up here. All right. What does that word tell you? Okay, it's cold. All right. A season. A season. Okay. All right. Christmas. Good. Okay. What's that word? Table. You see any connection between table and winter? Not really, do you? All right. What about this word? If I remember how to spell, that'll work. Um, is that does that word? I mean, do you school winter? Uh, it's misspelled. Is there another S here? One F, two S's. One F, two S's. All right. Told you I was from Tennessee. There we go. There we go. The Aggie knew how to spell. That's pretty good. All right. So, okay. Um, so, do what? That two out of three is good. All right. So, are you seeing any connection between these words? Right now, it's just words, right? And you could define these, right? And you may start to have images or or ideas that are associated with those words, but I'm going to keep going, okay? Let me do another one here. Stone. Sorry, stone. That's an N. You also can't read my writing. I'm, maybe I shouldn't be the one teaching on language. All right. Anything there? You see anything with that one? All right. Okay, so I've got some really, really ones who are kind of tracking with me here. Yes. So what if? I, but what if I did this? Like, if you weren't quite starting to get there, what if I added some other stuff here? What if I went? What if I did that? And then what if I came over here and I wrote? Would you start to make some connections? Yes. Yeah. All right. And then especially, maybe you're still like, I don't know. But then, what are we talking about? Narnia, and not just the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Why do we know it's that particular story in the series? What, what words make you? The stone, the stone table, the Winter, yeah, yeah, yeah. All these right here very much connect you to even one of the specific stories within the seven stories of the Chronicles of Narnia. So I did that to say this. When we're talking about the language of the gospel, it has got to be connected to the story of the gospel. If we're going to speak the language, we've got to know the story. And that's what this next, that big idea section there. Let me, all three of those blanks, I'll just go ahead and tell you. Put the word story in each one while I read the statements, okay? Listen to this. Story gives meaning to language. Every word we know has meaning because of the story in which that word was defined. 
when we had Narnia words up here, if you see the word table and then you see the word stone, if, you, if you're familiar with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, right, you just, you don't, you know, if you just see those words, but you don't associate them with the story, they don't mean as much. But when you connect them to the story, that's one of the most powerful images in that first book, isn't it? Because that's where Aslan sacrificed himself to save Edmund. So the connection to story with words is so important. And that's true with the gospel. The words, the vocabulary, vocabulary that we use to describe the gospel mean so much more when they're connected to understanding the total story of the gospel. And we said last week, where, where do we find that story? Is it in a specific book of the Bible or a specific chapter of the Bible? Where do we see the gospel? From where to where? Beginning to end, Beginning to end right? The whole Bible is telling the story of the gospel. So to be a gospel-centered culture that's full of gospel-fluent people, because that's what we want to be. I mean, if we're, if, if we, you may not even know that's what we want to be, but I'm, but I'm telling you, that is what we ought to be as the church, a gospel-centered culture full of gospel-fluent people. If that is who we're going to be, we need gospel language that's correctly shaped by the gospel story. So that's what we're going to work on tonight and next week is, is working on the story of the gospel and building our vocabulary of words that help us be fluent in the gospel. So that's kind of where we're going for the next two weeks. So before we jump in to the deep end here, Romans 1 verse 16. Anybody got a Bible handy that would read that for me? Or maybe you know it right off the top of your head and you can quote it for me. Anybody? Romans 1 16. You'll read it? Go for it. Thank you, thank you. So look back at verse 16 one more time and answer this question. How does Paul define the gospel in Romans 1.16? What is it? Yeah. It is, yeah. First and foremost, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Do we think of the gospel that way all the time? That, God, that, the, that the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that if we were to say, what is the gospel? The gospel is the power of God on display through the person of Jesus Christ. Right? So start thinking about it that way. The gospel, it's the power of God that we see evident through his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But first and foremost, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. There's power in the gospel that's available for us as his children because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. Now, we went on, right, as I said that, that what is the gospel, you all were saying, you were using the whole verse to define it, which was excellent, right? That's really good practice. It is the power of God for salvation. But is salvation, a, a, is it just like a one-time prayer decision? The salvation, we talked about this last week a little bit. When we talk about our salvation, there's so much more to it than just the fact that we've been forgiven of our sin, that Christ has taken our place and been our substitute, our salvation is a lifelong journey. It is a lifelong process, right? You remember, remember our three words that we say when we talk about salvation? There's kind of three things we think about. Tell me the next one. Yep. And then the last one. Good. So when we think about the gospel, 
It is the power of God for salvation. Paul's talking about all of this. He's talking about every bit of this, that the gospel that he is not ashamed of, it's the power of God that declared him righteous, that took his sin and gave him the righteousness of God. It's that, but that it's also, he's not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that is conforming Paul daily more and more into the image of Jesus Christ to where he looks more like Jesus. He acts more like Jesus. He talks more like Jesus every day. This is the power of God as well. But then there's a part of our salvation that is not yet fully realized until he calls us home. And that is the fact that when this life is over, for those of us that are his children, Jason's been talking about it on Wednesday nights in Recharge. We will spend eternity with him. That's the power of God when he makes all things new, when he defeats the devil, and, 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 it is, and it is finished. He restores everything to how he created it in the beginning. All of that is the power of God, and all of that is the gospel. So that's kind of what I want you to be thinking about as we go along, because if we're going to be fluent in the gospel, we have to start with understanding the full picture of, of the gospel and everything that's involved. So as we get started, I want us to, we're going to talk tonight about the first two, I'm saying it this way, we're going to look at the gospel in four movements or four pieces of God's story. So we're going to look at the story of God, which is the gospel, in four parts. Tonight, we're going to try to get through two of them. And then next week, we're going to try to get through two more, okay? So we'll just stop when we stop, and um, we'll pick back up where we pick where we leave off, okay? But before we get started, I want you guys to watch a video that walks you through all four parts, okay? So I'm going to give you the 30,000-foot view so you see the whole story, and then we're going to dig into the first two pieces. Is that good? There is only one story that answers life's most essential questions and gives a lasting sense of purpose and meaning. It's the story that inspires all other stories. It's the true story that defines every one of us. This is that story. How did it all begin? Like all stories, this one begins in the beginning with the author, who is God. He spoke everything into being. With a word, galaxies appeared with stars and planets. Earth was designed for life to flourish. Everything God made was gloriously good and breathtakingly perfect. The highlight of God's creation was the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. God entrusted everything he created to his beloved children, giving just one rule. They were not to eat fruit from a specific tree. They lived in loving obedience worshiping God as their heavenly Father and enjoying perfect harmony with creation, each other, and God. Considering our world today, its obvious perfect peace didn't last. Turmoil, war, sickness, troubles. We each have our share. What went wrong? It started when a fallen angel named Satan grew jealous of God and determined to ruin the perfection of creation. Satan took the form of a serpent and enticed Adam and Eve to question God's goodness and rebel against his one rule. In disobedience, they ate the fruit and peace unraveled, ushering in sin and death, which still plagues us today. If we are honest, we are very much like Adam and Eve. We all rebel against our heavenly father, making our hearts heavy with fear, guilt, and shame. Our bodies are weary with sickness, disease, and death. Earth is afflicted with storms, calamities, and disasters. Even worse, sin has separated us from God, causing a permanent divide, a miserable separation called hell. The fallout of sin has been catastrophic. It's inescapable with no way to fix it, leaving us all to wonder, is there any hope? The love that prompted God to create us also prompted him to send a savior who would set everything right again. As centuries passed, 
God shared exact details of the coming Savior's birth, life, and death. Everything in the Bible points to this rescuer. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to earth as God the Son to fulfill the promise. He was born miraculously, as his mother was a virgin. Just like us, Jesus grew up and experienced life on earth. But unlike us, Jesus never sinned and always obeyed the Father. When Jesus was in his 30s, he began teaching all around Israel, pointing people to God's kingdom and performing many miracles. After a few years, he was wrongly accused and sentenced to an agonizing death on a cross. Jesus lovingly gave up his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind. He died a perfect death, taking our place, the innocent for the guilty. But the grave couldn't hold Jesus. Three days later, God brought Jesus to life again. Jesus defeated sin by dying on the cross and defeated death by rising from the dead. Today, Jesus sits at God's right hand as king and judge over all creation. This is the story of rescue God has authored. He invites us through repentance and faith to make his story of rescue the one we trust in and live from. When we do, everything changes. And now, what will the future hold? For everyone who trusts in Jesus alone for rescue, God has promised to restore your heart and set you free from sin's hold. Because God is loving, kind, merciful, forgiving, tender-hearted, and true. God has also promised to make all things new. One day, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, forever free from sin. Everything that causes pain and sadness will be gone. God has also promised to be with us forever. The moment you trust in Jesus, your relationship with God is restored because Jesus has closed the divide sin caused. Getting to know this all-loving God starts today and continues forever. For God's story never ends. You can make God's story the foundation of your life even now by admitting your need for God's rescue, asking forgiveness for your sin, trusting in Jesus Christ alone to rescue you, following Jesus in faith from this moment on. This is God's story. Will you make it yours? All right, what'd you think of that? <laughs> Very good animation, right? It definitely keeps you engaged. But did you see the four movements of the gospel story through there? All right, those who were, all right. Let's write them down on the board, okay? What was the first one? Creation, Creation. all right. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and write them out. Like I said, we'll get to, hopefully we'll get to two. Tonight, what was the second movement? The fall. All right. Rescue. Rescue was third. <laughs> the rescue, very good. All right. And then we've got... Okay, good. So here's what we're going to do for the next two weeks. We are going to take these four movements, starting with creation, and we're going to think about Scripture. Like, where would we go if we want to see the creation story? Where are we going in Scripture? We're going to Genesis chapter 1. Very good. All right, so... We're not going to take time to read it, but if you've got a Bible, I would say go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 because here's the exercise that I want us to do together, okay? This is lots of audience participation tonight. 
Remember how we said if we're going to be fluent in a language, part of that is vocabulary, right? We have to know the, the words of the language. Let's start building the vocabulary that of words about creation that help us understand that part of the story. So when we're thinking about creation, we're answering some questions. You heard it in the video. How did it all begin? Began with God, right? And then we looked at what was that like? What kind of world was it that he created? So help me just thinking through. Let's just go ahead and start doing this. What are some of the words that you would think help explain creation and how that ties into this story of God that we're looking at that helps us speak the gospel? What, what words do we need to know to tell this part of the story? Okay, so creation, um, it's, it's beginning. All right, what else? What are some other words? It was formless, okay? God, all right? It's a good one. More? It was sinless. Sinless, all right? All right? The world that he created in the beginning, here's the one creating it. Here's what he created. It was perfect. You see what we're doing? We're kind of crafting it with some of these words. Like that. So spoke, right? Um, press into this for just a second. Does the Bible say, does it explain how God began? What does it, what are you as the reader to know from the way it starts? There's another good one. Tells us about the nature of God. He was eternal. What about his creation? We said it was perfect. What does he say over and over about his creation as he, as he looks at what he's created? He says it was good and it was what? Very good, right? Genesis 1.31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. We see, I went through Genesis chapter 1 today, just looking back through this passage and underlined every time we read, God said, right? Somebody said that word stands out, that God spoke, right? It was with his word, the words of God, his word and his work. It was with his words that he created. He spoke, God said, God said, God said. It's all through chapter 1 of Genesis. But he's not by himself. Okay? I like it. So, so what do we see then? What do you mean by that? He says, let us, so the Trinity. Okay. All right. Perfect, yeah, I mean, we know that, right? We, we would need, you know, we understand, though, that he says, let us make man, right? If we, if we dig into that, we start to see that this is the Godhead, right? And as we unpack Scripture and we look at the entire story of Scripture, we see that, I mean, this would really be getting deep and it gets past creation, but we start, we could go through in Scripture and see how each person within the Godhead, their role in the gospel story, right? They all play a part in the story of the gospel, but we see it right out of the gate in Genesis where he says, let us make man, and there's, a, there's something that follows that that's also really important in this story that we've got to know if we're going to speak fluently the gospel. So, and who's he talking, what are he talking about? Is he talking about the birds and the reptiles and the fish and the animals? When he says our image, what part of creation is he talking about? Man and, and woman, right? Man and woman. And he says, let us make them in our 
image bearer. So humanity in creation, God's design was that we would be his image bearers. That's another important concept, vocabulary word, however you want to however you want to define that. That's so important. God's design was that we would be his image bearers. But he goes on that we would call this the creation mandate, what he told Adam and Eve to do in creation. You see it in Genesis chapter 1, what does he tell them to do? Yeah, to fill the earth and to Subdue it, have dominion over the earth, right? Man and woman, in in the perfection of the garden that the perfect eternal God created, he gave man as his image bearer the responsibility to fill the earth with his name, to fill the earth and to to rule the earth, to have authority over the earth as his representative, right? In submission to his authority, to be his image bearers and fill the earth. That's part of the creation story. Any other words? These are all really good. This is excellent. Other things that creation, maybe the words aren't in here, but what are some things that we could start learning from the creation story about that help us understand the gospel better? What does creation and what God did in the creation account, what does that start to tell us about ourselves or the world? Yeah, I mean, we can come through passages like like the Psalms or Romans that talk about the uh, the glory and majesty of the earth displays uh, the power of the invisible God. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Because there was nothing before he started creating. Okay. So he is, so we would say he is the source of all. He had a plan. It, it okay. Was yeah. There we go. Purpose. Do we find our purpose as, as men and women? Is part of our, is our purpose rooted in the creation story? Well, we were made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. We were told to bear that image. We were, we were created. Our purpose was for relationship with God. Created for relationship with Him. Yeah. Order. Okay. Just adding all these in here. All right. You can expound like image bearer, and you can you can look at passage like Psalm uh, uh, one nineteen, or not Psalm one nineteen, uh, Psalm, Psalm one thirty nine, yeah, and just think through like the beautiful things that it says about God's thoughts towards us, um, the the attention to detail, all of those things. It, it, the, the whole purpose is so that you have colorful, uh, uh, exciting, attractive language for what Scripture would say about us. Yeah. You knew me, right? I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, I read an incredible uh, theologian that took that, that Hebrew language, which I'm no Hebrew scholar, but he took that language of Psalm 139 the word fearfully and the word wonderfully. He said that is the language of of an artist crafting a -a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. So when David uses that language, he's saying each and every image bearer that God, who's the source of life, displayed his power by creating. He was creating this work of art to bear, that was to bear his image, to reflect his glory. in in the earth. Now, does that give, is there, I mean, are we searching in our world today? Let's let's get practical. Are we searching in our world today? Are people searching for purpose, for identity, right? I mean, are we we constantly, 
right? I mean, you don't even have to get beyond, you know, the homepage of, of Google, right, to see man's, like, cry for significance and value, worth, identity, right? Even saying, well, I, I'm not what I should be. I'm an accident. I'm, I'm, I'm a mistake. I should have been this, but I'm this. I mean, we hear that's becoming common vocabulary for us to hear nowadays, isn't it? But if we go back to the story of God, what do we learn about our identity? Is it a mistake? No, there's order. It's very purposeful. So if we are going to speak the gospel to ourselves, if we're going to speak it as a community of believers, and if we're going to speak the gospel fluently even to our coworkers, our neighbors, right, friends, family, is this part of the story that we've got to know really well? It, it's got to be because the rest of it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in the story if we don't know this part of the story, right? It's, it's your hook. Yeah. Why they should listen. Right? I mean, you're going to get to the bad news here in a second. <laughs> <laughs> right? The good news is that you're an image bearer. And I love to ponder what does it mean to be an image bearer? Right? Because it means like, like God created, but we love to create art and music and engineer things, build things. Like all of that stuff is good. And, and animals don't do that. But it's good because we're image bearers. So to press into that, that's the hook that says, hey, look, look at all that God has done. Yeah. And how he's made you. Yeah. Like, yeah, work. And, every, and everyone appreciates, when you see that creativity elsewhere, mm -hmm. be it art, be it music, be it just anything else. We see it, and we are awed just a little bit. It doesn't have to be on the athletic field. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's take image bear while we're on that. That's exactly right. Do you know people who you, would, who you would categorize either by their own definition or just by your observation that they were lost, that they, they, were, they had not been made new, they were not a believer? But do you know people in that category that show kindness or compassion and love? Why do they do those things if they don't have the Spirit of God who has regenerated them and made them new? Why are they able to show characteristics that we would attribute God, to God? They have not heard the word. Imitation. They're an image bearer, right? Yeah, they're an image bearer. Yeah, and so even, even when they are dead in their sins and trespasses, are they still... As a man and a, or a woman, are they an image bearer of God? Were they created in God's image? Yeah, and so we still see evidence of that image, even though they've not been made new by the gospel. We could even still see that in, in people around us. And we can understand, we see this story at work. This is, I mean, this is so foundational for us. So before we move on to the fall, Let's take some of these words and let's kind of begin telling the story a little bit of creation and how that ties into the gospel. Everything. This is using your words, okay? Because I thought these would be some of the words. So I've taken some of these words, put them into a little bit of a narrative form, okay? Everything came into existence through the word of God, right? We said he spoke. Everything came into existence through the Word of God. Everything that comes into existence through the Word of God is what? Very it's very good, right? So God's Word and God's work can be absolutely trusted. Right? Would you, would you, would you agree? Was that, is, that, are those, is that making good connections to some of these words and some of this vocabulary of the gospel, it can be trusted and it can be depended upon because the perfect eternal God who spoke it into being 
by his own testimony, said it is very good. He placed Adam and Eve in a garden. And he told them his word, right? You can eat of everything in the garden except for this one tree, right? By God's own testimony, by his own word and work, should they have been able to trust him? Yes. Yeah, because would they even exist without him because he's the source of all things? So we have, here's keep going with some of these words. We have our very existence through his word and his work. So therefore, our identity and our purpose and all truth can be found in God's word and in God's work. Right? Those are two really important words we can remember in thinking about creation. God's word and his work. He spoke it into being. It was perfect. That is that is is everything kind of builds on top of that. In creation, man and woman were called to submit to God to rule over the earth on his behalf and to fill it with more image bearers of God who would do the same thing. That's God's design. Now, that's really important because here's where we probably could get any, if we left this room and the first person we met, like if we all just got in our cars and took a field trip to HEB, right? (laughs) Well, Right, there, there may be more, let's, let's go to Walmart, okay? Walmart may be more colorful. Um, let's go to Walmart, all right? We all just get in our car and we go to Walmart. And we walk up, you can pick anybody in the store. And you just walk up to them and you, you ask them this question. Is our world broken? Are there problems in our world? Is our world a mess, right? Phrase the question however you want, but get to the heart of it right there. What answer are you probably going to get? If you ask 100 people, out of 100, how many yeses are you going to get? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, maybe someone that doesn't have a phone or a TV or access to a computer and never leaves their house. But if they never leave their house, then they're not at Walmart, okay? So, I mean, you can't go in Walmart and not know the world's not broken, right? I mean, even just going in the store, you recognize it. Um, but we can get, we can even get agreement that everything we just talked about here is not how we find the world today, right? So, but we, but this, that's why this is so important that this is central to us speaking the gospel and even understanding how to evaluate the world around us. We have to start with when we look at the world around us and we see the brokenness, and we grieve, right? We have to start with, but this is not how God intended it, right? Because if we start here, which this is easy to see the fall, right? There's not a lot of, there's no hope here, is there? There's no life here, right? That's another word we didn't didn't write down, right? The creation account, it's all about life. Right? Who breathed the breath of life into mankind? God himself. Right? We don't see life in the fall. We see the opposite. So we've got to start here as believers if we're going to be able to point people to Christ. We can't start here. We've got to start here with let me tell you what the eternal God created. How did he create? Right? Even in the, even in the video we watched, It says he made a perfect world that was in harmony. Everything worked as it should. That's the first part of the story. So you see what we're doing now a little bit, just working with creation, how we're taking some words, we're building some language with vocabulary, we're putting it into context, we're looking at it, right? we're adding that grammar, we're structuring some of these words together to craft the story of the gospel that God is telling all right, so let's do it with the fall while we've got, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, 7.45. I let you out early last week, so I'm going to make up for it tonight. So I'm taking my time back. So I, got, I slipped up. Jason reminded me. I had 10 more minutes I could have kept you last week, and I didn't do it. So look out. You're in trouble now. All right. The fall. 
He, the video started with this, and I did like this about the video. Um, and next week, I'll try to remember to give you some resources. That video is actually an app, and you can have it on your phone and almost use it as a gospel track that you can keep right on your phone to walk somebody through the gospel. It has those pictures, and it even has questions that you can ask, right? So with creation, it says start with how did it all begin, and then you can walk them through that. The question for the fall, where did it all go wrong? Okay, so with the fall, where would we go in Scripture? This is important to know. Where would we turn in Scripture? Genesis what chapter? Where would we start to see the fall, right? Genesis chapter 3 is where we see the fall, right? And then we can see through the rest of Scripture the results of the fall. But I want to give you two passages, and even your kind of homework for the week is to look at Genesis 3 and the first part of 4 and to look at Romans chapter 1, the second half, because you can really begin to understand the language that helps you understand the the ramifications of the fall. But let's just start with what we know from Genesis chapter 3. Um, Let's start building some language, some vocabulary here for the fall. What? What words describe the fall that we see start to come out in Genesis 3? I see disobedience. All right. Okay. Okay, the serpent is there. All right, so we see we see the serpent. Right. Um, let me do good and evil. Craftiness. All right, we see temptation. Limitations. Okay. Deception. Deception. Uh, let's put that up here with the serpent. Yeah, a lot of that's tied up in, in questioning the goodness of God. Okay. Yep. Shame. Good. Help me with some more of those. This is all results of the fall. We see shame. Destruction. We see destruction. I heard death. What what are some other ones? Pain. Pain. What? Blame? Hmm. Uh, in. Is that right? Enmity. We'll say strife. For those of us from Tennessee, that way we know what that word means. Um, fear. Ooh, that's good. Questioning. I got that one up there. That's good. Um, separation. I, I knew I'd heard another one that I wanted to write in. Sadness. We'll say grief. Guilt. Guilt. Yep. (coughs) Guilt. All right. More? Is that a pretty good list? That's not a good list. <laughs> let, me, let me use my words carefully, right? That's not a good list. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive list. How about that? There's a good word. Yeah, it didn't take you long to throw these words up here, did it? It, it didn't take anywhere near as long. Um, punishment. Could we add punishment to this list? Um, hiding. Brokenness, curse, infected. If we were to get on past Genesis 3, we don't see that Adam and Eve were affected because of their sin. Who else becomes affected by sin? Yeah, they're kids, right? I mean, we see it right out of the gate. I mean, Adam and Eve sin, they question, they rebel. We could put the word rebellion up here. Right? And then we see with their sons, their oldest son is a murderer. 
his own brother, right? I mean, we, so I mean, we see the infection of sin right out of the gate in the fall. This screams that this, what God did in the beginning, this man and woman who were complete, lacking nothing, they had perfect harmony and fellowship with God. Now, do they have a huge need? Right? This screams <laughs> desperation and need, longing, right? Hmm? Brokenness. Brokenness. Yeah, absolutely. And it's self-inflicted. It's self-inflicted. It, it is. You're right. It is. Daniel? Sir? Could add chaos to that? I could add chaos to that. It's another great word. Good. All right. So... Okay, well, I, I like that, and of course this is a general list, but to me the serpent of deception is probably the source of it all off. I mean, rather than disobedience just comes next. You know, and I look at that and I wonder, why would God let that happen to his chosen people? He could easily destroy the, the fallen angel or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think he was testing everything yeah. into that to see how they would yeah. react. Don't do it, which to me says that he wanted to see if they would, there would be obedience. I don't know if it makes sense or not. Well, give them a chance to choose. Yeah. Giving them free will, giving them a chance to choose. How about desire? There's desire, yeah. In the fall, we see their desire. What would happen if, if they never took the bite of the fruit? Then we don't have the fall. <laughs> Man, we're getting into some deep waters here. This would, this would take much more than 15 more minutes. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> in, in, the, in the creation, you said created in our image. Uh, that's an image bearer. And then in chapter 3, it says, uh, now man has become like one of us to know good and evil. So what is the difference between being created in our image to becoming like one of us to know good and evil? There's a difference there, obviously, because it makes the statement twice. Right. What verse is that? Huh? Go for it. Take it. Uh, I know so, we're not on the golf course, but I can't uh, answer it here. So, in, in the first, in creation, who is the one who declares that which is good? Uh, yeah, so God repeatedly... After creation, he is the one who declares uh, that which is good. And so uh, part, uh, part of the deception of Satan is that uh, he, he tempts with partial truth, never, uh, never with whole truth. So um, when, when he makes the declaration, you will know good and evil, previous to it, God is the one who declares that which is good and evil in man. As, as created, submits to that. And so, so man is supposed to sit under obedience and go, like how should Adam and Eve responded to the serpent's temptation? No. Right. Try, try this, try the fruit from this tree. Has God really said that? I mean, he, he gets them with like, uh, I mean, basically he starts with like, is God a cosmic party pooper? Like he doesn't want he you can't eat from any tree in the garden, right? He's saying God's a cosmic party pooper. He, he doesn't give good gifts. Question God's goodness. But then uh, the the knowledge of, of good and evil is tied to the fact like see you could a doctor knows uh, about cancer knows lots of things, but it's it's different when the cancer is inside of you. And so the, the fall and this knowledge of good and evil and this shame is now inside of them in terms of, so that's the fall. So anyways, all of that to say their simple response should be, God is the one who declares that which is good and evil. Uh, I trust him. He's been good so far. He says what goes. I'm going to go that way. Versus God was tracking, him, but to cause him to step away from God the first. There had to be something in them them from God. Something was there. What was that? Well, it's, it's this temptation. 
it's this temptation of God is holding out. Look at the way they're tempted, right? God is holding out on you, right? You you could be more. Same thing that that as we understand Satan's fault, right? Oh, you could be more. So there's this pride that rises up, like, is God holding out on me? Is he not giving me enough? And and so that's that's where it, it starts to yeah, but Jason, I was just talking about two statements that God made. In chapter 1, God makes a statement, let us create man in our image. And in chapter 3, verse 22, he says, then God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good from evil. So in those two statements that God makes, do you think your question answers that? If it does, I'll, I'll leave it alone and walk away. I'm good. Well, to be made in the image of God doesn't mean all things. Right. I, I don't become omniscient. Sure. So you have to then work through what does it mean to be made in his image. Yeah. Uh, this this aspect of discerning good and evil, they have crossed over, but they've crossed over into the fallen sense in terms of now they know they know evil on the inside. It's yeah, experiential, not just it's not just a con it's not conceptual anymore. Now it's experiential. They now have let sin. They've rebelled against God. They now know evil because they, they are evil. It's part of who they are now. Yeah, it's a loss of innocence. Um, so let's, let's talk then. This is good conversation. Let's do what we did with creation. Let me take these words and start to put some thoughts together with our vocabulary, okay? Because here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to do it. I want you to take some of these words that you could pull from the text, from Scripture, and I want you to put some statements together that help you articulate what God is doing in creation and the results of the fall so we can start to build this, right? Because there's many statements we could put together. Here are the ones that, that I wanted to do from some of these words. The serpent, we talked about the serpent here, convinced Eve that God's word was a lie and his work was not good. Right? Remember, we talked about that over here in creation, God's word and his work. What did the serpent do? Convinced Eve that God's word couldn't be trusted and that what God was doing wasn't the best, right? Like we said, he's holding out on us. So Adam and Eve then looked away from the giver of life, the sustainer of life, and they looked to the one whose intent was to destroy life. They took their eyes off the giver of life and chose to put their confidence and look to the one whose goal was to take and to destroy life. Adam and Eve surrendered their God-given authority that he had given them to have dominion over the world, and they surrendered that to who? The to the serpent, to Satan. Right, and so we start to see in passages like in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and John 12, 31, describes Satan as the one who has authority in this, in this world. Right? We start to see him, the prince of this earth. Right? He's the one that's causing the chaos, right, Lauren, your word, right? The destruction, the brokenness, right? Why did Satan, why does Satan, why does he have that? freedom and that ability right now to do those things. Where did that come from? God. It came, well, it came from the fall, right? Adam and Eve surrendered their God-given authority to have dominion, to rule, to subdue the earth at, in submission to God's authority, to be his ambassadors, his representatives on this earth, to fill it with his image. When they took their eyes off him and rebelled and looked to, you know, Satan. Instead, they surrendered that right. And that's part of what we see in the fall, the brokenness that we see. How do we deal with the fact that God knew it was going to happen? Oh, that's a whole nother class. But <laughs> that's a word that I guess we would put that word up here over all of this. And that would be God is sovereign which gets to the question, right, which we definitely don't have time to get into right now, that if God is eternal, he's omniscient, right? He knows the beginning from the end. 
If all of that is true, and I think we all would, would testify that that is true, then that means even in creation, did God know that this would take place? Did he know that he would have to send his son to rescue? So why did he do it? If he knew all of this would take place, that he would have to pour out his wrath on his own son to redeem his creation that he knew were going to fall. Why would he do that? To glorify himself, to prove that he was the only one that could. To, to bring glory to himself. Remember, we, we talked about that a couple of times over the course of all these classes, that we are most satisfied when God is most glorified, when he is glorified. When our attention goes to see his, him in, all, in who he is, his power and glory and love, grace, forgiveness, even his justice, yeah, all of it points to him, right? And that's part of, as hum, humanity, yeah, I mean, we can start to really, you know. <laughs> well, and it's, all, it's also part of, of creation in the fact that, that God created us you say not as robots, but but with the choice, because uh, the highest form of love always involves choice, and uh, so it, it genuinely speaks to the magnificence of our creation, right? And, and with kids, I always use the illustration like, what's a better pet, a, a goldfish or a dog? And and like every kid says, a dog. And the reason is is because like the goldfish, it just swims, it doesn't do anything. There's no response. Yeah, you can't interact dog with it. You can relate to. And so as you climb the ladder, right, it, 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 why, is, why is my wife a better relationship than my dog? Well, honestly, because my wife can choose to leave me. That dog, <laughs> she'll never leave me. Right? She'll never leave me. But, but like, there's, there's reward with it. It's, yeah. it's deeper. Yeah. It's, it's the only way it can be. Yeah. It's a form of recognition too. Mm -hmm. You know, if if we if we really love something, we want we want people to know about it, to know its characteristics. Yeah. And it's our choice to do that. Yeah. When and he hoped we would do it, he wanted us to do it, but he gave yeah. us an opportunity yeah. to choose. Right. I mean, it. We we can start to tie all these things together, right? The holiness. Um, say it again, Miss Carol. Oh, I, I said he he wanted. To respond to him. He gave us the opportunity to choose him. He wanted that, but if he had not, then we'd have the robots that Pastor Jason just mentioned. Yeah. We wouldn't really be in his image. There's a depth and there's an intimacy to the relationship when, when we recognize all the facets of God's character, right? God's love really means nothing without God's justice and his holiness. Right? Because it's not, it's not love, right? God's grace, God's mercy. The fact that he does not give us what our sin deserves, that's mercy. But that he does give us his righteousness, that's grace. All that God gives us. Those things really don't mean anything if God is not a just God who has to punish sin. If he's one who just says, well, I know what I said, but oh well, I'll just forget it this one time and we'll just pretend like it didn't happen. Well, now he's no longer just. And if he's not just, then he's not perfect. And so then it doesn't become a sacrifice, his atonement, his sacrifice for our sins so that we can have a relationship with a holy God. That doesn't exist anymore. So all of these facets of who he is help us understand the depths of, of him, right? Which ultimately brings glory to him, which gets back to the whole purpose for why he created. It gets to the purpose of why he saves. It gets to the purpose of why he's going to make all things new, right? And even in the fall, he is glorified because when we see the depths of our depravity, where does that make our eyes go? To the magnificence of his what? Yeah, he's glorified even in this. So let me finish crafting a couple more things and then we'll have to call it a night and pick up next week. Spiritual, we use the word death. I don't even, yeah, death is on our list. God's, 
word to Adam and Eve, right? Don't eat of this fruit. The day that you eat it, you will surely die. Death, three types of death that we see start to play out in the narrative of creation moving into the fall. We first see spiritual death. Adam and Eve died spiritually. Their relationship that was in perfect harmony with God was broken. They died spiritually in that very moment. How do we know that? They felt shame. They felt guilt. They hid from God. They knew they were naked and they they covered themselves. All the things that we do when we feel sin. Do we do all of those things? Do we shrink back in guilt and shame? Do we try to hide and cover it up? Now, all that is showing just that, that death, that spiritual death that has occurred. But they didn't just die spiritually. Relationally, there was death that occurred. Do we immediately see strife and enmity that, that starts to happen between God's created beings, between Adam and Eve? What, what, is, what, is, what does Adam do? Well, it's not my fault. It's this woman you gave me, right? (laughs) And she goes, well, it's not my fault. It's that serpent that you put in the tree, right? I mean, we immediately see strife in relationships. And we go one chapter over, I mean, and it's compounded. Now we have a brother killing a brother because of sin. So there's death that occurs relationally. And then ultimately we see physical death, right? The first physical death, and sometimes we don't think about this, but in order to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness, this exposure now that they were aware of because of their sin, when God clothed them, what does it say that he clothed them with? Skin from an animal. What had to happen in order for God to use the skin of an animal? That animal had to die. Blood had to be shed. So death was an immediate byproduct of sin. Even in the very, very beginning when he took the skin of an animal and covered their shame and their nakedness because of sin. So we see death as a result, all of those things. There's a passage I want you to look at this week. I told you in Romans chapter one, starting in verse 18, looking through the end of the chapter. There's other things about the fall in Paul's language as he's looking and describing humanity, as he's looking at this gospel story and he's building (laughs) this, this beautiful, magnificent case for the gospel and the beauty of it and the power of it, right? Romans 116 is kind of his 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 thesis statement. I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? So he starts to unpack this story. Right, and in chapter one, he shows the fall and just the and all that it's causing. He uses phrases like they became futile in their thinking. They thought they were wise, but they had become fools. They exchanged the glory of God for a lie. Rather than worship the creator, they worship the created beings. Then we start to see all that comes from that, all these just ripple effects and these dominoes that started to fall as a result of the fall. That would be a good passage to read, to just to understand the impact that we all experience today as a result of this part of the story. But it's a part we've got to know because this is what helps us be able to answer in our own lives, but also in our relationships with others to be able to talk about what went wrong, right? And to be able to identify when we see brokenness in our own lives, right? Rather than just give up, right? Or sink into a depression and lose hope, we can say, wait a minute, that's not God's design. It's a result of this, but as we'll see next week, but God didn't leave us here. There is hope because we see from the very outset that there was a rescue plan. Paul tells us before the foundation of the world, before this even happened, God knew he was going to do this. So it's all connected and we're going to start to see that next week. So your assignment over the next few days You'll see there, I want you to take Genesis 1 and 2, and I want you to write down from those verses 
things that help give you a foundation for understanding and a vocabulary for speaking the gospel from creation. Very much what, like what we did tonight. And then do the same thing for the fall by looking at Genesis 3, 4, and Romans chapter 1. Kind of do this exercise yourself. Because if we're going to get fluent in the gospel, we've got to be able to do this. We've got to be able to handle the word of God and what we understand about his story and start to articulate it in a way that helps to give us language for ourselves and others. Sound good? Yes. All right, hopefully this was really helpful tonight. Next week, we're going to jump into these next two. And then the next three weeks, we're going to start saying, okay, now how do we speak the gospel to ourselves? How do we speak it to each other in the body of Christ? And then how do we speak it to the lost that he's called us to share Christ with, okay? All right, amen. You guys have a great rest of your week. We'll see you Sunday.